Thank you, thank you Chairman McGovern and members of the Rules Committee. Um, I want to say that, you know, I agree that I think as Democrats and Republicans, we all understand that uh, people are hurting and that there are a lot of challenges out there. But I think the difference is that as Democrats, we feel that we should take action here in Congress to, to meet those challenges and try to address those challenges. I, you know, from the perspective of our committee, the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, you know, we have this continued public health crisis that uh, mostly relates to COVID. We have a, a rapidly escalating climate crisis, which the world recognizes. That's why we're having this conference in, in Glasgow next week. And then, of course, there are the long-term economic challenges, which are, which are uh, severe. But what I wanted to say um, from the perspective of the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, goes back to, I guess, what I said last week, and I'll try not to be repetitive, Mr. Chairman, because for from energy and commerce purposes, there aren't a lot of changes from the bill that we uh, saw, uh, that we discussed here last week. But I said three things. That I, I said that we're looking at this as Democrats uh, in sort of a three-pronged approach. One was the American Rescue Plan, which was a direct response to COVID, uh, the fact that uh, people were hurting, many people were unemployed. We gave them cash payments. We did child tax credits. Uh, we increased the, uh, the subsidies that they received under the Affordable Care Act, among other things. Um, and mainly what we did with the American Rescue Plan was to try to get us back on track in terms of the COVID crisis uh, by making sure that more people got vaccinated, that we didn't have uh, shortages because of the supply chain at the hospitals for ventilators and those, those types of things. And then um, with the BIF, because this is the other bill, it's not before the committee take because you already had it, but with the bipartisan infrastructure framework, there was a recognition that our infrastructure is falling apart, whether it's roads, bridges, um, and I don't think it's just New Jersey uh, where we have major infrastructure needs, but it's also our sewer lines, our, our water pipes, uh, you know what happened in Michigan, uh, in Flint and other places. Um, but there's also the recognition in the Build Back Better Act, which is the bill that's before you today, that if we're gonna change things economically for people that are hurting, that we have to look at things like child care, like pre-K, like public housing, like uh, what was added today with family leave, um, as well as other, as well as build on some of the other things that, that are out there. So I, I wanted to um, just focus, if I could, because again, I don't want to be repetitive from last week on the health and the climate provisions, if I could. And with regard to the health uh, provisions, uh, the one thing that is different that wasn't in the bill um, last week is the, this effort to reduce prices for prescription drugs. And I know that uh, Mr. Thompson explained that uh, to some extent, but I just wanted to tell you uh, where we are. I mean, it is different from HR3, which is a bill that I sponsored. I would have preferred HR3. It's not exactly HR3, but it does have uh, the three provisions, the three most important provisions of HR3. One is uh, this cap on out-of-pocket expenses uh, at $2,000 a year out-of-pocket costs, which is significant for our seniors under Medicare. And then it has the inflation rebate, which says, you know, you can't continue to raise these prices beyond inflation, otherwise you have to pay a rebate. We had some drugs that went up 300% during the COVID crisis. I thought that during the COVID crisis that, uh, you know, the drug companies would try to give everybody a break, knowing that, you know, everybody was hurting, uh, but it wasn't true. We had major price increases that continued. Uh, for prescription drugs throughout the uh, COVID crisis and continue today. Uh, and then the negotiation, which is the, the part that has changed uh, from HR3, but still the basic idea, which is that there are a number of drugs out there uh, that are in widespread use that have had major price increases, and that the only way we can effectively bring those costs down is by having the Secretary of HHS uh, negotiate prices and, and force the drug companies to come to the table. And so basically the idea is that you would choose 100 of these uh, drugs that have the most wide for use and have the biggest price increases. And over, this, over a course of years, you would, try, you would have a process uh, to negotiate the prices for those drugs which are primarily under uh, Medicare Part D. Um, I don't want to get into a lot of detail, but I, I do want you to understand that this does not apply to the initial exclusivity period, right? In other words, as we know, I, uh, I, I, sh I dare mention Dr. Burgess because he'll we'll have a debate for a long time, but he knows very well 
uh, that if it's a molecular drug, it's patented for five years, it's a biologic, it's for 12 years. We don't negotiate during that initial exclusivity period, but we do start negotiation for these 100 drugs uh, after nine years, an additional four, uh, and after 12 years for the biologics. Uh, and we start, as I say, with a list of about 100. So that's pretty much it. The, the other, uh, as far as the, the, the drug price is a concern, but it is significant. It really is one of the most important things that people face in terms of the issue of affordability. On the Medicaid coverage gap, um, there are those states that have not expanded Medicare, uh, I, I'm sorry, Medicaid, the Medicaid coverage gap, that have not expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. We provided some incentives over the years, but a lot of them still won't do it. So we basically say uh, that we extend the subsidies under the ACA to the people in, in, in those states that haven't expanded Medicaid. We have a hearing aid or a hearing provision that's added to Medicare, very significant. Uh, we have a, a significant amount of funding for home and community-based services. Everyone here knows how difficult it is to get people to go into uh, be, be providers, be uh, home health care providers, because they don't get paid enough. So we're basically uh, making it so that they would uh, you know, have, get paid better, have better benefits, uh, and at the same time, more people would be eligible so they can stay at home, not have to go to a nursing home, not have to be institutionalized. The Children's Health Insurance Program, bipartisan program over the years, we make that permanent. Maternal health, we improve maternal health outcomes for vulnerable populations for pregnant women, uh, one year of Medicaid coverage postpartum. Uh, with regard to 9-11, which is something that is not just in my area, but across the country, those clinics that provide help for those people that were victims of 9-11, we expand that funding. Uh, with regard to the public health infrastructure and public health preparedness, uh, we have um, significant funding to continue uh, the, the deal with the COVID crisis, whether it's the lab, whether it's preparedness or other things of that nature. Now, let me just talk briefly about climate action and I'll stop. I do believe that collectively, the climate action piece of this bill uh, will meet the Paris goals, will meet the goals that the United States says it wants to achieve uh, through the Paris Agreement. Um, a lot of that are the tax credits and the uh, uh, that are provided uh, to get utilities uh, to move away uh, from uh, fossil fuels uh, or, and into renewables. But again, if you use coal or use fossil fuels and, you, and fuels and you can capture the greenhouse gases, then this is e energy neutral. You can use coal. You can u do nuclear. You just have to make sure that you capture uh, the greenhouse gases. Uh, there's all kinds of things in grants to individuals as well as industry to try to get uh, them to, um, to move away from increased greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I know there was some one criticize the electric vehicles, but that's a significant way of reducing greenhouse gases. Uh, we also upgrade the, the electricity grid around the country. Many, or many rural areas, uh, the electricity grid is you know, collapsing or it cannot be hooked up to renewable resources to capture the renewable resources. Um, I'm not gonna go through the whole list, uh, Mr. Chairman, because I think that uh, you've heard uh, quite enough. But I did want to mention one more, uh, a couple more things. One is uh, lead pli uh, uh, pipe replacement. There's money in the uh, in the Senate bill. But there's more money, an additional nine billion, to try to get rid of those lead pipes that are making it so our drinking water is unsafe. Uh, many of you have ports. I know Mrs. Torres has talked about this before, uh, where there are where we have to reduce the air pollution at the ports. That's significant. And the last thing I'll mention it if I dare, even though I'm sure that I'll, I'll get some. Uh, criticism from Dr. Burgess. We have this methane emissions reduction program, which we talked about before. I know you weren't happy with it, but I do want to mention that that's a significant factor in trying to reduce greenhouse gases. But collectively, this is really going to make a difference for climate and make it possible for us to say that we are taking the lead on addressing the need to reduce greenhouse gases and, and address uh, the climate uh, problem that we face. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank I you. I appreciate the opportunity.